Okay. So we can again do something clever, and I won't go into detail, but you can do permutation tests. And so this is how you would do a permutation test for your uh, very uh, for your tooth growth data. So in this case, you can shuffle. You remember that permutation test where the test where you shuffle everything. So if you don't want to make any assumptions, you can do a permutation test. This will give you the f for this permutation test, which is quite similar to the 0 0.02 that we had for supplement and dose uh, when we uh, when we did this. So this is quite clever. And there's a package called Vegan, which will do it. And uh, it's for vegetational distribution, not for studying vegan. So it's developed by, uh, by, by ecologists. So if you ever need that, so if you have problems with your violations of assumptions, you can do a permutation test. And then you don't have to worry about those assumptions uh, related to this. So now we have a continuous by continuous interaction. And so the following example comes from uh, the psych package. It's data from 231 undergraduates. You might have heard of the bed depression inventory. And then we have a score from neuroticism and a score for state anxiety. Yeah. And we could see whether the relationship between neuroticism and depression depends on state anxiety. Yeah. So is it, uh, again, this is a basic example. I will not go to all the steps of centering, for example, and that will change how you interpret it. And it will also reduce some of the multicollinearity issues. So again, this is just an illustration. So. This is how I would do this interaction. So it's the same thing, but now we have two continuous variables. So the back depression inventory is the dependent, state anxiety and their neuroticism score are the independent and their interaction. And we call the data and then we get this and we can get a significant effect between state anxiety and neuroticism. Yeah, on back depression inventory. So that tells us there's a significant interaction but because now we have continuous, it becomes a little bit more difficult to plot, right? Because we have three continuous variables. So in principle, you could plot like three dimensions and make a make a wave or like a panel. But most of the time, that's not what we want. So what we typically do is we look at, this is known as simple slopes analysis. We look at a shift of one standard deviation. Yeah. So we plot the mean. The me, uh, so we take as a model of state anxiety, people are one standard deviation below, one standard deviation above, and people are at the uh, mean or median, depending on your preference. Yeah. So in this case, you find that people who are very high on state anxiety, they will have a stronger response as the neuroticism goes up on the depression inventory. Yeah, you can see that slope going up, and you can have 95% confidence intervals, and you can see that this one is significantly going up faster than the other one. Yeah, so this is picking a point, so it picks one standard deviation, and we compare what happens at medium, low, and high. Yeah, of that third variable. We also might want to uh, print those value, values and see if they are uh, uh, significantly different from one another. So you could already see sort of a little bit on this, but you can get the, uh, the values, like minus one standard deviation, the mean and one standard deviation. And then you can get the estimates and you can calculate the 95% confidence intervals from those and to see if they overlap or don't overlap. Yeah. So this will tell you also whether there's a significant slope. So you can see this slope 0.64 versus 0.29, so that's twice the increase or twice the angle of, uh, of one versus the other, yeah? So that's sort of what you see here. So very, very slow curvature going up, very strong curvature going up, yeah? So this is arbitrary uh, based on the points you pick on your, on your slopes, yeah? So we pick one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below. Sometimes your data will be not very normally distributed, or one standard deviation below or one standard deviation above is not what you, you want to look at. We really look, want to look at the extremes, like the bottom 25% or the top 25%. And one way which we could look at all the data is using something as, which is known as the johnson nyman interval method. Very unpopular or very unknown in psychology, but it really is nice because it tells you the range at which the coefficients change. Yeah, And so to do that, we use johnson nyman interaction 2, we tell it which one is the predictor, we tell it which one is the moderator, and then this will give us what state anxiety is outside of this interval, the slope of the epineur is, uh, is uh, significant, yeah? So it will then also give you this nice little plot and say, this is all the data that we have, so only for this we don't have some data, and this is where there's a significant interaction, where the slope is different, yeah? So in this case, we don't have to pick points like medium, high, and low, 
It just gives you the range of coefficients across which we have a change, which could be uh, more useful and gives you more information, yeah? Because it also plots you what data you actually have and what data you don't have. So suppose you remember that you have this beast of homogeneity variance in regression it's heteroskedasticity. So we, there's also a way to do it in a robust way. We can get robust estimation for simple slopes by adding robustness t. And then we don't have to worry about heteroskedasticity in our, uh, in our data. And then you can see the results change after you do that. We can also make a different plot. Like we can change everything again. And so this is the same type of plot, but then it's uh, like a, a perhaps prettier plot. So you can change everything again. And if you wanted to, you can make your own little GG plot, which will have all the teams and all the cores. So in this case, we can use interact plots, our model. We can say which one is the predictor, which one is the moderator. We can say that we want a confidence interval, and then we can say we want a 90% confidence interval rather than a 95% confidence interval. Yeah. And the key thing, again, is that depending on uh, state anxiety being low or high, the slope changes or as we move along epineur, or like a, the neuroticism scores from the Isaac personality inventory. Yeah. So, any of you, have you ever done repeated measures in ANOVA between within design? I see somebody nodding at the back. Can you remind me what it was uh, about? What were the within uh, factors in between subject factors? What? You had within factors? You also have between factors or no between factors? No, oh, you've done it. Okay. Anybody else who has done a repeated measures ANOVA? No? So most of the time, for example, when we look over time or something, we will have a repeated measures ANOVA where we have within as the time progresses uh, and a between factor where you do a manipulation between. And then you see, for example, if one of the examples, for example, what Michael Smith does, he does his writing interventions. You could look at time one and time two. You have a group which has a writing intervention, a group which has no writing intervention, and then over time you can see if they become more happy or more satisfied or something like that. And so that would have a between factor, which is the manipulation, and within factor would which be over time, for example, to see how it changes. So if you haven't conducted one, that would be a scenario where you could use one. So, so a repeated measures ANOVA design, I'll give you another example for you to look at. In this case, we have a hypothetical language acquisition study, so how children learn a language. Uh, and it's similar to this design. We're interested in children who are raised bilingually, where one of the languages is the language they speak at home only. And the other language is also used in their school. And MLU, that type of thing in the analysis, is the mean length of utterance. So basically how long the sentence is. Yeah, as a, sen a sense of like how much they grasp the, the, uh, the, the text or the language. So we can get, you remember that we, from R we can read data directly from the internet. So in this case, I read the data directly from the swap link. So I see if I can copy and paste it. Oh, that's going to go horribly wrong. So this person has kindly put their text file online. This is what it looks like, yeah? And so we can read that directly into R without having to open or store it or do something like that, as long as the web link is live. I can see the mean length of utterance. It has some data on like whether the language is in the school or whether it's, uh, uh, it's uh, at home. And you also have the age. But the key thing here is that you can have uh, there's more than one observation per subject, right? Because we're looking at how uh, their age changes from preschool to first grade to second grade. Within an individual, so within an individual you have change, and between individuals you might have something like uh, like values like gender or uh, or uh, whether they are bilingual or not bilingual. Yeah. So what we can then do is we can. Uh, by now you know sort of know how the easy ANOVA commands work. We feed it the data set. We tell it our dependent variable is how long the sentences are, the mean length of the utterance. We have to tell which subject uh, ID it needs to use. And then we can have, as a within factor here, we can have language and age, because people might change from uh, stopping to speak a language at home or speaking a language uh, at school only, so that might get lost or change over time. And between, we have gender, because people's gender and these kids will typically not change as they, uh, as they progress 
through the schooling system. And then we have to specify again that it's the type of tree, type of uh, uh, errors we're after. It will print as a warning, so if this is a number, then automatically it will convert this number into a factor which we need for the ID variables. Okay, so you remember that we have these type 1, type 2, type 3. Again, you should always specify explicitly like it's type 1, type 2, type 3 to make sure that you get the type of errors that you want. If you don't do that, you're left to the default and you're going to have to look in the package what its preference is. Yeah. So that's something where uh, SPSS by default will always do type 3. Here it's best to always say, I want this one, I want this one, I want this one. So again, we can call our, uh, our, uh, our data with the dollar sign. We have the p values and the significance, and because we can have a three way interaction, it will do by default this fully factorial ANOVA. Yeah. Uh, so you can see there's a language effect and an age effect, but it doesn't seem that there's any other significant effects in this, uh, in this data set. You might have heard of these beasts that you have to do when you have repeated versus ANOVA, which is uh, sphericity tests. So you might have remembered these type of things like greenhouse geyser corrections and all these other things. So go back to your, uh, because you should have done, have any of you not done repeated measures and ANOVA as part of your undergraduate? You all should have done this probably as part of your third year bachelor degree. If not, go back and look, but these be, if your data is spherical, then you have some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, well, if you basically, it's the same as homogeneity of variance violations, but now you have within and between factors. And you can have some tests. In this case, we don't have to worry because none of them are significant. And otherwise, you will look for the corrected statistics like greenhouse geyser and all these other uh, Heimfelds. You remember all those type of terms. Yeah. So we can have sphericity corrections, and this is the greenhouse uh, geyser correction. And you can also have Heimfeld corrections if you want to add those. So depending on that, your supervisor will again tell you, oh, you have a sphericity violation, and I really like Heimfeld. Give me the Heimfeld things. This is where you get the corrections. Yeah. So that's the end for, uh, for today. You have some time to stay uh, behind with Alex if you didn't manage to finish all the in-class exercises or would like to work on your other exercises. So I had some fun. I compiled a data set from watching The Chase. <laughs> so I, uh, it has 50 episodes of The Chase. Uh, I coded all of them. Uh, we, you have an Excel file in your, uh, in your uh, data set. And I would like you to test the assumptions for a 2 by 5 opponent's anniversary to see like what is the highest offer made by the chaser? So that's a number. So uh, you might remember, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with the chase, but basically you have the gender of the contestants and you have the opponent. And I wanted to find out here if, for example, if you are facing Mark or whoever it is, whether if you're a man or a woman, he or she gives you a different higher offer versus a lower offer or something like that. Yeah. So that's a two by five ANOVA. And I would like you to calculate post hoc contrasts. I report them in, as a paper. I'd like to make a beautiful violin plot to see if uh, Mark is different from the Vixen or like uh, whoever there is. And uh, then I would like you to do a two by two like gender and age on, on, on chosen, like the amount chosen by the contestants. I would like you to make a plot with interaction. And then as a bonus, you can uh, play further with the salaries data set. You can test interaction effect with year service times years PhD. Do this johnson nyman interval range that I've shown you. You can use vegan to this permutation test, which I've shown you. And you can use party to model high in this uh, in, uh, data set from the chase. Again, don't worry too much about the bonus things. This is really to challenge you if you feel that you're sailing through everything. This is to challenge you. If you make the basic things already, that would be very good, because those are the ones that map onto your uh, assessment. OK? Any questions at this stage? I might have rushed a little bit through the repeated measures ANOVA, but just go back and look. It should ring some bells on how greenhouse geyser corrections work, how sphericity corrections work, and what a Heimfeld and all these other tests are. No questions? Then I'll leave you with Alex and, uh, uh, and Sarah if you wanted to do some further practicing. So I won't be here next week because uh, you will have other things, like I think you have for your presentations or some other things coming up. And so the week after that, it will say lecture six, and then we'll have uh, lecture six, and then we'll uh, move further along. And so in the meantime, 
I'll post some things on the blackboard, and I'll also post some things in the thing uh, in next week's session. Then these are optional for you to look at some other additional things. Use the time to catch up with the exercises if you haven't done so, and start working on your assessment, which is due end of November, if I'm not mistaken. So, okay. Best of luck. What did you use to age? I think it's a